Team Rhino. Today we are talking with Dr. Terry Roth, uh, Director of the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden Center for Conservation and Research of Endangered Wildlife and the Zoo's Vice President of Conservation and Science. Dr. Roth also serves on the International Rhino Foundation's Board of Directors. Also joining us today is Paul Reinhardt. He's the team leader and keeper at the Cincinnati Zoo. Today is Hera Pan's 13th birthday. Hera Pan currently resides at the Sumatran Rhino Sanctuary, or SRS, in Indonesia. Dr. Roth, Paul, welcome to this live chat today. Dr. Roth, I wonder if you could get us started by telling us a little bit more about Harry as he's affectionately called. Oh, sure. You know, Harapan is a wonderful part of a story that kind of unfolded here at the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden over a couple of decades. Um, and that was the story about learning how to breed Sumatran rhinos, such a critically endangered species. I became involved in this program in 1996 when I first started working here. And at that time, there were only three Sumatran rhinos left in North America. And thanks to the cooperation of the other zoo partners, the Los Angeles Zoo and the Bronx Zoo had sent their female rhinos to Cincinnati where the single male lived at the time. And this cooperation gave us an opportunity to really try and figure out how we could breed this species um, kind of as a last ditch effort with these three rhinos. And so um, with my wonderful colleague, Paul Reinhardt, who's on this with us today, um, we teamed up together and through a combination of um, a lot of really solid, good science and excellent and creative animal management skills um, over the years, we were able to study the Sumatran rhinos reproductive physiology um, and really learn and understand it. And we were also able to um, get the female and male together for breeding, which um, nobody else had really done yet. They'd tried in Malaysia, Indonesia, the UK, as well as North America. And at that point, nobody had yet been successful. So there was just so much unknown about this species. Um, we worked really hard, learned a lot. And um, actually relatively early on, we figured out how to get the, the pair together, the, the fertile pair together for breeding. One of the females unfortunately had developed a tumor in her uterus, so she was not part of the, part of the breeding program after we, we determined that. But the other two um, actually produced a pregnancy fairly early um, and we were extremely excited and, and um, very, very hopeful. But then we faced another challenge and that was pregnancy loss. Um, and the female lost the first pregnancy. We thought she would probably get pregnant and keep the second one, but that didn't happen. Turns out she ended up losing five pregnancies. And finally we put her on a hormone supplement, a synthetic progestogen that she could, in, that she could just take orally. And anecdotally, that seemed to do the trick because the sixth pregnancy went to term and resulted in the wonderful birth of Andalus, which is Harapan's older brother. So um, that's kind of the background story, but we didn't rest on our laurels with that one birth. Um, as you know, with a critically endangered species, we need to produce as many calves as we can, as quickly as we can. So we went back at it and produced another calf and then a third calf, which was Harapan, who was born in 2007. And he was the last calf born here at the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden. And his birth, interestingly enough, was a little different than the first two, um, as I recall, and, and Paul can chime in if he remembers it differently. But, um, you know, for the first two calves, Emmy, the female who had these calves, really made a lot of fuss prior to the delivery. She paced, she pawed. We knew 24 hours out that she was about to give birth because the signs were so obvious. With Harapan, that wasn't the case. And in fact, I didn't even get to the zoo before he came out <laughs> during that delivery. Um, I got the call and I got on the road, but I live about 40 minutes away from the zoo. And I was still on the road when Harapan was born. Uh, I think Paul was probably there, but the, the other thing that was different about Harapan, he actually came out backwards. So his hind legs came out first instead of his front legs. Um, and this is not necessarily uncommon in rhinos, but our first two had been born front legs first. So it was the first time we'd seen one delivered hind legs first. And for some reason, the delivery just seemed to go really, really quickly. Um, yeah, so he, he, he came out quick, but it was fine, um, you know, and of course, with each birth, we were always very nervous about it. We were very careful. We prepared for all different contingencies. Um, but we knew at, by the time we were on our 
third one, we knew that Emmy was a wonderful mother. Um, we figured she would take care of it well. She, you're always a little bit more relaxed if you're not dealing with a first time mother. So I think for Harry, we're a little bit more relaxed. And then the birth happened just so quickly. <laughs> we didn't have to go through that 24, 36 hours of stress that we had to with the first two. So that was kind of nice. Um, so yeah, his, his birth was kind of special. So what does, um, and uh, Paul, you can jump in here too. Uh, what does hair, what did hairpin uh, mean to Cincinnati? And he also, he's more than just, uh, just a, tra you know, he's a world traveler. He traveled a few places in the United States first before heading to Indonesia. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about that story too, Paul. I, I believe that hairpin is, is very people oriented. He grew up with the keepers here at Cincinnati Zoo. Uh, I traveled with him. He went to White Oak Conservation uh, in Florida. And then from Florida, he went to Los Angeles. I didn't travel on that leg, but uh, I did move with him from Los Angeles. He came back to Cincinnati and from Cincinnati to Wacombus, Indonesia. and he's a very people oriented rhino. He likes people. He, he liked the company. Being born in a zoo and around people, everybody always said, well, they're solitary animals, but animals in zoos don't really know that they're solitary. They really like the company of people. That's where all their good food comes in. Uh, maybe companionship, if you want to call it that, but he was always very attuned to when we would come into the building and uh, just all around, he's a very people oriented animal. Great, um, Dr. Roth, I wonder if um, you could uh, tell us uh, why the decision was made to move uh, Harapan to the SRS in Indonesia. Yeah, well, you know, when this program began back in the 1980s, um, there was an agreement between Indonesia and the U United States and the UK as well um, about the Sumatran Rhino Trust. And in that agreement, Indonesia offered to send a few rhinos out of country to the UK, to the US, um, to establish breeding programs here. And in return, um, we were providing some resources to help save the Sumatran rhinos in country there in Indonesia. But things changed over the years. And um, at this point, with so few Sumatran rhinos, Indonesia decided that they really wanted to keep what rhinos they had left in country um, and continue to conserve them and continue to, you know, work with others. But also, um, they, they weren't they weren't planning at this point to, to send any more rhinos out of the country. So we had to make a hard decision. Um, you know, we could have kept Harapan here. As Paul said, he was very charismatic. He captured the hearts of everybody in Cincinnati. Um, but it just, it's, it felt wrong. Um, it felt like what he needed to do is have an opportunity to contribute to the survival of his species. That was not going to happen here without a female that he could mate with um, and produce offspring with. So yeah, we made the hard decision that, you know, it was, it was the logical decision, but emotionally it was difficult that, you know, he needed to move um, to Indonesia. And what softened that a little bit is the fact that the Sumatran Rhino Sanctuary in Wakambas is such a wonderful facility. Um, and the staff there are so, have years and years of experience and really know how to take care of these animals. So we knew he would be in good hands, even though the departure was, was tough. And Paul, you made that, that journey with him uh, to Indonesia. And I actually have some photos I'm gonna pull up here. Uh, but I wonder if you could share what was that like making such a long trip? Well, we packed plenty of food along for the, uh, the journey. Uh, on that picture there, you can see at the bottom, there's boxes of browse. What we call browse is uh, tree cuttings, uh, plants from usually California and Florida. It's what they eat naturally in the wild. Uh, it's what he ate here in Cincinnati. It was a long trip, um, but I genuinely believe it was made a, just a little bit easier for Harapan, knowing that uh, there were people there who he was familiar with. 
uh, rhinos, other animals in human care, they do recognize people's voices and the way they carry themselves. And um, he had a friend along, a couple of friends actually. And uh, all in all, he did, he did fantastic. He got a little restless here and there when it was normally time for him to get up and eat or uh, be on his routine. He got a little bit restless, but all in all, he was really good. So we packed a ton of brows, uh, cases of apples and, and bananas, which he really loves. Uh, those helped to keep him settled and uh, couldn't have asked any more. It was, again, there was a long journey from from planes to trucks to, uh, well, and a, a ferry also. Um, he did really, really well. And uh, I did, I, I'd like to, to think I helped him a little bit by being a, a familiar face. <laughs> That's great. And it's, uh, it's nice to see. Um, Dr. Roth, can you tell us uh, a little bit more of the uh, operations at the SRS? and um, you know, possibly talk about the expansion which Harry has moved into and I got a picture. Of yeah, the, the, you know, the Sumatran Rhino Sanctuary was actually um, built in the 1990s in, a, in a, a real combined effort between the International Rhino Foundation, the Indonesian government, Waikambas National Park and the Indonesian Rhino Foundation. Um, and the goal there is to, was to get rhinos back more into a natural environment. So it was built in a forest, um, where Sumatran rhinos um, once lived and they thought that they were gone, but it turns out they weren't. So there are Sumatran rhinos still living in that forest. Um, so we knew it was the right habitat for them. Um, the enclosures are very large. So the rhinos get an opportunity to browse as they would naturally in the wild. They have multiple mud wallows in various locations, but at the same time, they are maintained under human care. Um, and so they do get managed intensively. It gives us the opportunity to make sure um, that they're checked every day, that they're healthy, that they don't have any wounds that need to be um, worked on. And they also do get fed supplementally. So we make sure they have plenty of food. Um, the rhino keepers there are fantastic. They know these rhinos um, really, really well. And some of them have been with them since the beginning, since the center first opened, they're that committed, they're still at it. Um, so it's, it's really neat. It's, it's a place where uh, the Sumatran rhino can do almost all the, the same behaviors its um, wild counterparts do, um, but they don't have to face the risks the wild counterparts face out there. Um, so it has, it has been a, you know, a, hu a tremendous um, part of the breeding program and because the animals are actually in human care and the keepers can work hands-on with them, they have succeeded in breeding the Sumatran rhinos just as we did in, in uh, Cincinnati, which makes the Sumatran rhino sanctuary now the only breeding center, the only successful breeding center um, in the world and a, a very, very critical part of saving this species. So fortunately, very fortunately, we had a, the International Rhino Foundation had a wonderful generous donor um, provide the funding that was necessary to actually expand the SRS because now that they've produced a couple of calves, you know, you rhinos are big animals, they need a lot of space, so you fill it up pretty quickly. Um, and we feel like we're going to need more space um, as the breeding program continues. Um, so, so that was, that actually has happened and they've built another um, big ring of enclosures, which has basically doubled the size of the SRS. And there is now commitment from the Indonesian government to bring some more rhinos into the facility. So there's an opportunity that we might be able to get some new genetic diversity, which is also going to be very important for this program long term. Um, so yeah, so it's, there's been some real positive developments in the last couple of years, and it's, it's really exciting to see. Great. I have a, a question. I think that it's a good time to ask it from uh, our audience that's watching today. Um, they asked, do the Sumatran rhinos only eat browse in the wild or will they also feed on grass, um, similar to say the, the greater one horn rhino in India? I'm, I'll take that if Paul doesn't want to. I, the, the Sumatran rhino is much more of an obligate browser than the Indian rhino or greater one horned rhino. So what that means is that um, they probably eat very little to no grass. 
uh, in the forest. I, I can't say they don't ever eat some grass because they, they probably do, but um, the greater one horn is kind of known as being one of those species that's in between, that does a lot of grazing, but also does some browsing. And folks who have studied, scientists who have studied them in the wild have reported that, you know, there's a portion of the time they will spend browsing on shrubs and trees, but the majority is actually grazing. Um, the Sumatran rhino, that's not the case at all. It's, they spend almost all their time browsing. Thank you. Um, yeah, go ahead, Paul. I was just going to throw in there that uh, these animals, what I've told people is they've adapted to life without the sun in that they, they live in the forest. Uh, they eat these smaller trees that are trying to grow up uh, amongst uh, the bigger trees. And, um, and they just, the one thing I remember clearly is when I was there and one of the animals walked off into the forest and it absolutely just disappeared. It, uh, it just gets hidden behind all the trees and shrubs and, and the growth, the undergrowth there. And it's just amazing how much that they blend in and they just, they, they were just absolutely gone. They're still there just 20 yards ahead maybe, but they, they really blend into the forest the way you really can't describe in words. That's a, that's a great transition. Um, Ms. Dr. Roth, I, I wanna ask, I, the SRS is a, is a key part of a, a larger strategy for saving the Sumatran rhino that the Indonesian government has developed and that there are many partners involved in. Um, I wonder if you could talk about some of the other activities going um, on in um, uh, Sumatra and other places um, to save this critically endangered species. Yeah, there, there is. Um, the breeding center is just one component and a very important component, um, but we're also concerned about some of the population that may have become real fragmented at this point, um, the real small populations, and if there's animals that are no longer um, able to meet up with another of, an, of the opposite sex, then the breeding's not happening, and that's a concern. Um, so the, the rangers are starting to look for some of these animals and try and figure out where these animals are, and um, the government does have plans to potentially try to capture some of these isolated animals. Um, some animals that we think are probably not going to thrive without human intervention. Um, and I think conservationists are becoming more and more convinced that the Sumatran rhino needs human intervention at this point if it's going to survive at all. I know there were a lot of folks who were rather opposed to the breeding program when we were involved in it back in the early uh, 2000s, but um, now I think all conservation organizations are, are all on board and they agree that um, we need to do something. And, Along those lines, there's been a new formation of the Sumatran, the, basically a Sumatran Rhino Survival Alliance, which is a, a cohort of multiple conservation organizations all working together um, at this point because we see how critical it is that the Sumatran Rhino needs help and it needs help from a bunch of us. Um, we can't, certainly nobody can do it alone. And so it's a great partnership and we're hoping that there's going to be a lot of positive results that come from that too. And, in building additional um, sanctuaries that can hopefully mimic the success of the SRS in different areas of Indonesia, and then bringing a few more animals in for the breeding program, but also ramping up protection of the wild populations that we think still have a chance to survive. And I think that's a very, very important component. We can't lose sight of that. that that's great, and I'm glad you mentioned it. And uh, I put up on this screen, um, the uh, you can find out more about the um, partnership to save the Sumatran rhino at uh, savesumatranrhinos.org, the link on the bottom of the screen. Both the International Rhino Foundation and uh, the Cincinnati Zoo are partners in, the, in that uh, um, activity. So um, you'll see more of that um, in, in the future, uh, but definitely check them out on the web as well and uh, see what, what everybody is doing in uh, Sumatra to, to save these wonderful rhinos. Um, before we move on, uh, I have another question from the um, audience, and uh, it is, does Harry have uh, breeding opportunities at the SRS? And uh, I'll give you a little graphic to go by there, Dr. Roth, if you want to 
talk about uh, some of the opportunities uh, um, in, in that facility. Yeah, Harapan has been given the opportunity to breed with uh, females at the SRS. The staff have been working with him um, for a couple of years now, and, um, and he's made some progress, um, but to my knowledge so far, he has not been successful. Um, but they, but they're definitely they definitely have been trying and and it, the some of the some of the feedback has been quite positive about him actually mounting females. I just I haven't heard that he's yet actually succeeded. Um, but clearly there's there's a couple females there and um, they are they are working with Harapan and, and and giving him opportunities to both females at this point. Yeah, they they like Harry. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Paul. Uh, I, th I think there's a big learning curve when it comes to male Sumatran rhinos. When they're young, they, they probably take a long time to learn because Andalus was very aggressive in, in the very beginning and other males have tended to be very aggressive. So it's not a matter of just putting these animals together and, and nature takes its course. Um, you have to be there all the time but Andalus now, I, I guess, has turned into a, a gentleman and, and he's really come a long way. Uh, but I just wanted to throw in there that there is some learning that has to be done with the males when they're introduced to the females and the keepers, whoever's around, has to be very, uh, very alert to what they're doing. And on, on Zoom, we had a, uh, a question, um, Dr. Roth, of are there any uh, pregnancies on the horizon at the SRS? Um, and so I know we can't go into any great details on, on any specific rhino, but uh, maybe you could take that in a general fashion. Well, I, you know, I, I can speak for all of us that we're hopeful that there is a pregnancy on the horizon. Um, that, you know, they're working at it. Um, and um, because of this issue that we face with early pregnancy loss too, um, everybody is pretty cautious. Um, so if and when they do have a pregnancy, um, I, I, I don't think it'll be announced very quickly. Um, so I just ask everybody to be patient. Um, I know um, the staff is working hard at it and if something doesn't work after a while, they're making changes and trying something else or a different pairing. Um, and as to Paul's point, Paul brought up a brilliant point because we haven't talked that much about it, but the behavior of these, of these Sumatran rhinos is extremely challenging to understand. Um, and I would say now that we understand the reproductive physiology, the, the bigger challenge to breeding them is understanding their behavior. Um, it's, it's very, they're each individuals, they're each different. And to be honest, it's such an endangered species that people are scared to take risks. And so it's really hard to decipher when you should actually leave them together when they're being aggressive and when it's too aggressive and you need to separate them. Um, that's a tough call, it's a tough call for anyone, even if you have years of experience. Um, yeah, Paul and I went through it many, many times because our male in Cincinnati was not particularly kind and gentle. Um, so we, we know what those guys are going through over there. Great, um, I wonder if uh, you both could talk to what has been the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, I know zoos across the United States, across the world are, are closed. Um, and the SRS has taken some um, precautions um, in order to continue uh, the expert care that they give to the rhinos at, uh, at that facility. I'll, I'll go first, Paul, if you can, you can join in. Um, yeah, I, I think first and, and the most obvious thing is that there has been some work, some conservation efforts that have been a little bit delayed or postponed because of the COVID. Um, so that's, that's, of course, unfortunate. That's the situation for the work pretty much across the globe um, because, you know, we are working on a somewhat of a timeline with this species. So we're, we're anxious to, to gear things back up, but we can only do that when it's safe. Um, and it's not necessarily right now. So. Other than that, I think to take a, a broader perspective on this, um, I think, you know, everybody's being cautious and we're being careful because we don't know that much about COVID-19 and we keep learning more every day. Um, we assume the rhinos are probably safe from it, um, but even that we don't really have any guarantees about. 
Um, so everybody's being as careful as they can. But I think uh, the bigger picture, I'm hoping there's a silver lining to all of this because um, what we really need to do is we need to understand how interconnected the um, wildlife populations and the human populations really are. And we need to change some of our behaviors. And the illegal wildlife trade is a problem. Um, and I think I'm hoping that after this all goes through and we get over on the other side of it, people are going to actually really start seriously um, taking actions to stop the illegal wildlife trade, which is obviously where COVID-19 originated from. Thank you. Paul, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, I'm, I'm not a, a scientist by any means. Um, I'm a hands-on, a keeper, but the keepers that take care of the rhinos at SRS devote huge amounts of time to them. They, they stay there for a week or two at a time. And they, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they went out there and they'll stay there for the duration of this whole thing if people are not allowed to move freely and if it's safer to, uh, for those keepers to stay there at the SRS, I'm sure that they would do it. These, these guys and, and, and girls are hugely devoted to these animals and I'm sure uh, this is gonna be a good example of it, I guess. Yes, the, the SRS has, has taken those uh, precautions as, as you've mentioned, Paul, and um, they are working in two teams spending 14 days uh, at a time living right at the SRS. Um, in between teams, um, there's testing of, of employees, there's uh, disinfecting of the areas, um, they're wearing masks around the rhinos, and there's disinfecting stations, um, both at every enclosure um, at the SRS, as well as at the, the front gate for any vehicles coming in and out or any people coming in or out of the SRS. Um, and it is closed to any outside visitation at this point. Um, they, they've taken um, that status at, a, at an early stage. So they, they really are committed to the safety of those animals. And, and uh, we thank them for their service. Um, what kind of uh, advancements are going on, Dr. Roth, that we might look uh, forward to in the future, um, particularly with the, the, the Sumatran rhino species, but maybe um, in general with all um, species of rhinos? Well, you know, technology marches forward. Um, and so there are a number of improvements that we've seen over the years that are, that are helping conservation scientists um, with all kinds of species, including the rhinos. Um, but, you know, for tracking rhinos now, we're starting to, or for any wildlife species, we're starting to use RFID chips, um, which is a, kind of a newer technology that's got broad use in the conservation field. Um, there's, people are starting to use drones for various activities to help get information on what's going on on these reserves. Um, and uh, of course, from the reproductive standpoint, there's been um, some advances in assisted reproductive technologies as well. And, what we face with Sumatran rhinos is we have a number of individuals that are probably never going to um, breed naturally successfully, um, the females in particular, because they develop these reproductive pathologies over time. So we need a way to make sure we don't use their, lose their genetic material and assisted reproductive technologies um, may allow us to do that. So there's work on a lot of different fronts, um, you know, trying to take it from every angle. Um, you know, we can it, kind of a, a triage, what can we do um, to make sure every animal contributes to the to its species when there's a population of fewer than 100 animals? And um, Paul, um, I'll start with you with this question, um, and I'll ask it to the both of you. Um, what gives you hope for the future of the Sumatran rhino? Well, there's much more attention being uh, paid to the Sumatran rhino now. Um, if I can back up a little bit from the time that we had Sumatran rhinos here, going back to the very late 1980s, uh, where they were already endangered and probably critically endangered, they talked about a number of, of possibly around 750 Sumatran rhino left. And through the years, that number kept being ratcheted down to Till now, we're at about 80 animals, they think. So 
So the, I, it's not too late. I wish it didn't take to get to that critical, maybe 80 animals left to really spur people, really spur people into action and get the notice of people around the world. Um, but the time is coming and we have to get these animals back in better numbers. And uh, the fact that they're getting the attention that they are now is going to be critical, I guess. Thank you. Um, Dr. Roth, uh, anything to add to that? You know, what I like to point to when people ask that question is um, the job in Rhino, uh, because the job in Rhino numbers have been extremely low for decades, and we still have them. Um, Indonesia has saved that, the job in Rhino, um, at least until now. And in recent years, the numbers have actually started ticking up again. So I see that as great reason for hope. Um, I mean, we already have a template on how to save a critically endangered rhino in Indonesia. Now, the job in rhino is still critically endangered, but at least we still have it. And um, its numbers were a lot lower than Sumatran rhinos 30 years ago. Yes, um, that's a, a great example to lead to. Um, in, in December, they announced that the population actually had grown to uh, 72. So um, it, it is rebounding. Um, there are obviously issues um, to deal with with, with um, bat species as well. But you can, that's definitely a, a great way to point to it. If you can get the animals together, protect them, and give them habitat that they can rebound on their own. I think I might have another question. Let me just double check. Um, while I'm looking at that, can you uh, tell us how people might be able to get involved? Terry, go ahead. Yeah, I think, um, first of all, I would say that everybody who's actually watching this right now is already helping out, um, getting involved, getting educated, spreading the word, um, of course, a lot of people can donate resources, which is very important to keep the good work going. Um, but then all of us are also voters and we can vote in a way that helps wildlife, not just rhinos, but all wildlife species um, in the future. So there are a number of things that I think people can do, but um, certainly sometimes the first step for people is just to get involved in something like this and learn a little bit more um, and lose their hearts to these rhinos like the rest of us have. Paul, anything you can add? I would just say, like Dr. Ross said, having the conversation and once people are allowed to actually go out and freely move about, just to bring it up in, in conversation and, you know, uh, mention the Sumatran rhino, tell people when you get home tonight, go to your computer and, and learn about these animals and um, learn what you can do. I'm not sure about, I, I know it's true that if you act locally, it, it makes a difference to the, to the whole world. Uh, but the more people know about these animals and the more the conversation happens, I think the better and it can really lead to much bigger conversations around the, around the world, really. Great, thank you. Um, any last thoughts? And I do have a surprise for you both before you go. My, my last thought, and I think I probably speak for both of, both of us, maybe most of Cincinnati, is that we really truly miss our rhinos here. Um, but at the same time, um, we do know, it, it, it helps knowing that they're in great hands um, they've getting excellent care and they've got the opportunity to contribute to their species. So um, we're satisfied with that, but boy, do we miss those Sumatran rhinos. I was going to say, uh, and, and at the time I know it was very uh, selfish, but we or I actually lobbied to our director to keep Harapan here because we really, really do. We, we were very attached to him and I thought, I felt like as an ambassador animal here, but he's in a, he's in a great place now. Um, I would also throw a, a shout out to Harrapin's mother, Emmy, who went well beyond and 
she was a star here. Uh, all the people in, in Cincinnati knew and, and loved her. She did her amazing part for, for the species. And Ipu was the male. Emmy and Ipu were the, the founders that were here and bred. And um, we had the uh, three calves born here. Um, so I just wanted to give a, a shout out to them. There's, you could probably talk all day. The horticulture team at the San Diego Zoo who supplied us with rhino food for many, many years. There's, there's so many people. The other keepers here at, at Cincinnati that took care of them. Uh, I was, I'm only one part. There were many, many keepers here that uh, did a fantastic job uh, taking care of these animals here. And again, we do miss him and them all, and we only hope and pray for a, a good outcome. I, I may not be around at that time, but uh, down through the years and generations, I only hope that uh, next generations will be able to, to see these animals. Great. All right, before you run off, um, and, and that, Paul, was just uh, you know, a great little segue there, um, <laughs> because uh, the SRS staff was kind enough to um, send photos, um, and they have celebrated Harapan's birthday, and I thought you'd like to see some of those pictures. <laughs> so I'm pulling those up right now for you, and... Um, uh, he got a, a a great birthday cake, as you can see. He's he's uh, he's uh, definitely anticipating uh, having that birthday cake <laughs> in in this first photo. Um, That's awesome. Um, the uh, both the keepers and the vets uh, took some time out to to wish him a happy birthday. Um, he did finally get to partake in his birthday cake. Um, <laughs> as you can see from uh, these next two photos. Um, so I wanna thank the SRS staff um, for, and Yabi for uh, our, our partner in, in Indonesia um, for uh, all their hard work uh, in taking care of these rhinos, um, for staying safe and keeping them safe during the, the COVID-19 pandemic and um, for sharing um, Harry's birthday with us. Um, so thank you to them. Uh, Dr. Roth and, and Paul, thank you so much as well. And uh, thank you for having us. And uh, everyone else, uh, I apologize for uh, the interruptions on Facebook Live. Um, we had some, some issues where it kept dropping out, but we will post uh, the entire um, video for you to uh, watch at, a, at a, a later time this afternoon. You can watch the, the whole conversation with, uh, with Paul and Dr. Roth um, and uh, all the wonderful uh, information that they shared with us today. Um, it's, a, it's a happy birthday to Harry. And before I go, thank you so much for joining us today. And don't forget to join us on Tuesday, May 5th. It's Cinco de Rhino and we'll have talks and games and other fun um, both here and on uh, Facebook. Um, and uh, we ask you to get involved by hosting your own virtual happy hour. You can um, uh, download the toolkit at uh, uh, rhinos.org uh, backslash Cinco de Rhino. It'll show you how to, to get your own um, a virtual happy hour uh, and you can raise uh, some money. We are starting a, a fund called the Reserve uh, Relief Fund, which is an emergency fund uh, for protection of rhinos um, during this pandemic with the loss of tourism dollars. Your dollars will actually go to support salaries and health and safety of those rangers. So we hope you'll tune in on, on May 5th, host your own virtual happy hour and have some fun on Cinco de Rhino. So thank you everybody and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Happy birthday, harapan. Harapan, semoga panjang umur. Happy birthday, harapan. Happy birthday, harapan. Okay, today we celebrate.
celebrate uh, Harapan's birthday, the 13th uh, birthday of Harapan. And then we wish that he will have a long life, prosper, long life, and then also a lot of children, a lot of calves. Happy birthday, Harapan. Happy birthday, Harapan.